is Robert Brown. This is my workshop in Obendorf by Salzburg. We have just been listening to Kit Armstrong playing a replica forte piano after an original instrument by a Jakob Belcher of approximately 1815. This instrument was built in this workshop in 2015 specifically for Herr Senator Gerhard Lenz. I've come to visit Robert in his workshop. Here are different instruments in various stages of completion. I know that you make wonderful instruments after um, originals from the past, but here you're also doing a restoration, right? Um, yes. what, what, is, what is this instrument? Uh, it's a forte piano built in 1804 in Augsburg by Jakob Friedrich Konrad. This instrument is undergoing a very extensive restoration. You can see that there is new material here, here, here. Um, this instrument has been taken completely apart and is now being put together again. And here is the keyboard which belongs to this instrument. Only the C and the F notes are to be seen at the moment. What I see here well, except for parts like that, is the original from Concord. This is the original keyboard, and it's very beautifully made. This instrument seems to be one that you're building yourself, and you've come quite far with it. So tell yes, me about it. this instrument is nearing completion. It is a replica of an instrument built by Anton Balta. The original is today housed in the des Landes Museum in Eisenstadt. Now, Walter is a name that we hear often in connection to the great composers of the Viennese uh, classical period, like Mozart. Like Mozart and Beethoven. Both these composers owned instruments by Walter. And this instrument, the particular interesting point about this instrument is, or the original, is the twin to Mozart's own instrument. Was there ever any evidence that he liked or disliked? the piano upon which this was based? There is evidence that he liked his instrument very much. He bought it in 1782 when he left Salzburg to go to Vienna. And we hear in a, in a letter by Leopold Mozart, his father, and also by Constanza, his wife, that he liked this instrument very much and used it a lot in his last nine years of his life. I see. So when I play, for example, one of these later piano pieces, I'm actually playing something which was written very probably for an instrument just like this. Quite likely. Can I play it? Unfortunately not yet. Uh -huh. You'll have to come back in a week or so. <laughs> It's not only beautiful and allows me to you know, do what I hear in my inner ear, but it's also very nice for the feel. And I would be very interested to see the action that makes this possible. Certainly, we can take the action out and have a look at it. Oh yes. We draw out the keyboard. And with it comes the entire action. This instrument has a typical Viennese action of the period. The hammer shanks are mounted on the key, on one end of the hammer head mounted on the shank, towards the other end the axle, and at the other end the so-called beak. And the beak has an important function because it is caught by the escapement. And as the hammer arise, rises, and approaches the height of the string, it falls back as it has already done. This is very interesting because actually, if you look at that, it's basically as soon as the point is reached where these two pieces come into contact, what you do with the key will influence the eventual sound that comes out. So this is quite different from a, a modern action because on a modern action, 
it seems to me that there's quite a long period from the this. part that you start pressing the key to the part where it actually has an influence. That, that is indeed true. The hammerheads of a modern piano are much heavier, and such heavy he hammerheads on such an action would make the action so heavy as to make it practically unplayable. That's why a modern piano has such a complicated action. But these instruments have very fine hammers. This action is very immediate, and this is what one requires for this music. Is it possible also to see the, the inside and the construction of this instrument? Well, unfortunately, Kit, we can't see the inside of this instrument, mm. but we can see the inside of a very similar instrument which we are building at the moment. It, it demonstrates the principles of Viennese piano making of the period, which is common to both instruments. It is the so-called A-frame construction. Here we have an A. This is the inside frame of the instrument with the internal construction and this internal construction absorbs or takes the whole three times the tension under which this instrument is standing. Um, the outside of the, ca the case, which one sees with the beautiful veneer, has in actual fact no structural importance. It is purely uh, the exterior of, of the instrument. And I suppose it has also no sounding significance. Well, I couldn't say that it has no sounding significance. Probably everything has some sounding significance. Yeah, but it's not directly connected to any I vibrating... Can't, I can't give it any direct connection. See. This is the soundboard. This is the most important element concerning the sound of an instrument. It is a thin membrane of wood of varied thickness from three to six millimetres. And on the underside of the soundboard, which is very important, are these what we call bars, soundboard bars, and they stiffen the soundboard and give the soundboard that quality of a sound. So it means the strings will be on the other side, the and on the other side. They're, on, they're in direct contact with this thin membrane, yeah, yeah. and that makes, them, that makes the membrane vibrate, yeah. and the membrane will then transmit the sound. You play a modern piano in the big concert halls all over the world. Why are you interested in a forte piano? I suppose that part of it is that I'm interested very much in music, just in the literature of music. And it is very true that a lot of the music that we play nowadays in the big concert halls was never written for the big concert halls. Or for the big piano. Indeed. And that's why I think that when I'm looking at a piece of music and I'm thinking, of course, of a certain sound, not necessarily thinking of the sound of the big concert hall, which may be very well the sound with which I've realized this music. Mm. But I'm thinking of, of this, I'm thinking of um, something like that, which, um, as we just saw, has a very close connection to what the composer was thinking of. I feel almost obliged when I play the modern piano to think of these exact same things, mm. even if had the modern piano come out of nothing without the whole tradition of music and of piano building before it. Um, even in that case, I would not have come upon these effects. Mm. But because I've heard these effects and how appropriate and uh, part of the music, of, of the old music that they are, then I try to search for these same effects on the modern piano. That's very interesting that you should say that, because in Würzburg you played a Mozart piano concerto. And after you played this, I received a telephone call from a pianist friend of mine in Warsaw mm -hmm. who said she'd heard Kit Armstrong play this Mozart piano concerto. And I can't help thinking she said that he must have played one of your pianos to conceive this concerto the way he did. Oh, well. You will come across, as a modern pianist, I think, a lot of passages which don't make sense, or ways of writing that don't make sense. Don't make sense on the modern piano, you mean? Exactly. Yeah. If you're um, playing through, let's say, the works of Mozart, or the works of uh, Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, mm. and there's some things which, on the modern piano, if you've never encountered these instruments, you just don't find a way to make them sound good. Do you mean to make musical sense? Yes, to, to make musical sense, or to um, make it not sound naked especially with uh, early Mozart or with Karl and Emanuel Bach, you have so many passages which are in two voices, you know. This is probably also why 
many people get this music to beginners because you can you can play the music with two fingers, and it doesn't sound very good on a modern piano. But you get a passage like that, and with a very colorful instrument, like the forte piano, which has a different color in every register and also in every dynamic level. Um, a passage from the the F sharp minor fantasy. to put more notes. Of course, on the modern piano, you very much want to fill in the chords. But what I mean is that if um, I now go to the modern piano and play the same piece as I have often in concert, then I hear the sound. And there are latent aspects, even in the sound of the modern piano, that one can bring out and um, emphasize in order to make this kind of color also bloom on a modern piano, at least in my year. You say you feel with a modern piano you need to fill out or add more notes that were written. What do you mean? Well, I can, I can try doing that. Because, because I, I have heard how beautiful, pure, and transparent it sounds on the forte piano, and I would very much like to recreate this on a modern piano, and maybe only because I've heard it, I think that uh, I have this sound in mind and therefore that I can create it. But I would agree that this spilled out, we could say, um, romanticized or brought into the late 19th century version of this piece would be more accessible and more easy. You use the forte piano in order to understand the music as it was written and to help you therefore interpret it on the modern piano, which is an instrument for which it was not written. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But of course, we also have to see that this is a wonderful instrument in and of its own right, that it is not simply a tool in order to facilitate or to make possible the presentation of old music on new, um, up-to-date instruments. Yeah. Because we can't really speak of up-to-date, right? And this, this instrument is perfect for the music and for the environment um, in which it existed. It should have as much of a right to existence today as um, does the modern piano. Well, I take that as a compliment. Thank you.